Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Salary Survey 2023 edition. My name is Jonathan Dankoff. I'm here with Andrew Mango Ogle. Hey, I'm and, here. And uh, also part of our crew is Sebastian Long, who is there with you all. Uh, so say hi to him if you get a chance. Let's go into the results. So we start every year with the notes on the results, and there's one sort of big story here for the year which is uh, mostly a mea culpa on uh, our end that um, we have significantly fewer results this year, largely because I didn't do as much legwork sort of socializing the survey as I've done in previous years. Also, we launched it a little bit later. Uh, for a variety of reasons, it didn't get the reach that we usually get, and so we have a lot fewer results. Um, that affects what we can record or what we can report because of our internal little rule around never showing data with any fewer than five results because we want to be mindful of PII. Uh, and it also has some effects on the model. Andrew, can you explain what changed there? Yeah, so um, yeah, we, I've also got a rule on the number of people in a group to be included in the model. So that's that's 10. So um, if there's a, a subgroup of a predict, like a level of the variable is less than 10, it, it can't be included. So let me give you an example. Um, contractor status, people who are or aren't contractors, um, they were in a predictor in the model in previous years. Uh, this year, we got less than 10 people who were saying that they were contractors. So uh, I couldn't um, include that in the model or attempt to include that in the model. And then I would just say just having a lower sample size generally means that we've got less statistical power. So the the model is going to be a, a bit less robust than previous years. What that means is we've got less predictors. I think it's important to still make sure to thank everyone. I mean, there are still 163 people who went out of their way mm -hmm. to take the time to give us this information about themselves so that we could share it and help uh, sort of illuminate the, the, the remuneration landscape in our discipline. And so I do want to make sure to say thank you to everyone that took the time to both fill it out, those who did take the time to share it. It is super important for us for, to get those referrals for future years. And, you know, um, just make a promise that next year we'll get back on the grind and try to do better, make sure that we get more people answering it. Uh, the last note, always important to, to, to just keep in mind as we're going through and showing you all these numbers, Every salary you see is reported in US dollars here just because it makes it a, a lot easier to compare. People gave us their salaries in the currency in which they earn it, but we convert it for the sake of the reporting. Let's hop in then to the results, looking first at where people work. Um, account by location is always where we start. And again, uh, you'll see smaller numbers here than previous years everywhere. Uh, Obviously, we don't think this is due to a massive reduction in the workforce. It's part of the um, outcome of having a smaller sample um, because, in part, the proportions are roughly maintained. So that, that is a sign there. Um, we had fewer than five this year in Germany, which means we had to combo it back into Europe. We had recently split it out because there were enough German uh, researchers. Uh, but we, we are remerging them this year with the rest of Europe in order to make sense of their data or make use of their data. And one interesting point to note here is that despite every other number going down, rest of the world has gone up. And so we saw an increase there. And so the best guess that I have is that this comes from uh, some of the work that the Discord has been doing, the Grux Discord, of growing their membership. Because we do have, I think, the large majority of our uh, survey respondents this year came from that Discord, from the links that we put in there. And so you know that's always been a goal for us to try to stretch the scope of the of the salary study and so we're happy to see that moving over to location and salary what you see here is a on the right in the map is a completely flat uh, contextless median of everybody from those areas and the salary that they earn uh, so you can get a sense of which parts geographically in north america and europe um, have the highest median average or lowest or whatever you're looking at uh, on the left-hand side, there's something different going on. I'll let Andrew explain to you what's happening there. All right, yeah. So, Johnny, for clarification, um, Johnny and I are doing separate uh, calculations here in parallel. Um, what this is, is uh, this table is an output from the model that I ran. And so what that means is that um, instead of just looking at the median, we are, I'm trying to control for some other variables to um, reduce the amount of noise that you might see in just like this, uh, 
this naked median. So um, in the model for base salary, we've got position level, years of experience in games or non-games uh, user research, and then organization type. So if you were to um, take two people and they were both juniors, they both had two years of experience and they were both working for a publisher, but one of them was in Quebec and one of them was in California, the person in Quebec, we would predict that they would be making 52% um, of what the person in California was making. And I also want to say also, Johnny was saying that Germany had to go into the rest of Europe. That's for his reporting. In the model, France and Germany are still uh, their own category. Right. All right. Next, uh, a little bit more bad news. So unfortunately, when we look specifically at juniors, uh, again, the smaller amount of responses has had a big effect here. We had to radically combine areas in order to, to, to show them to you. Uh, it's unfortunate because this tends to be, I think, one of the um, parts of the study that usually gets a lot of positive feedback from the people that use it because it's so important for juniors to be able to get a sense of how much, you know, what's a good offer as they enter the field. And so it does bum me out that we don't have as much to share here. Uh, in order to hit the minimum sample size, we combined all of Europe and UK, we combined all of the West Coast, and then literally everybody else in North America. And even then, I want to just call your attention that the number in red for Canada and the US, excluding West Coast, is a dubious number with a very large spread. So like, don't go like throwing this at hiring managers saying that this is what you'd expect because it's a little funky. Uh, and again, hopefully next year we have um, more useful numbers to show here. Moving on, when we look at organization type, uh, you can see that the majority of people are working at a publisher or that publisher studio. So that's like your EA or your Ubisoft. Uh, and then an even split between uh, internal to a platform. So that's first party, so Sony, Microsoft, for example, or a development studio independent from any of those two entities. And then the last category tends is uh, people that are working at independent research or a vendor. This can be useful to see sort of where you might expect to be working in the future. And then I uh, won't go into it again exactly how this all works, but in the top, you can see for base salary prediction, it's the same thing that Andrew just explained for the countries. If you are, uh, if your baseline is a publisher, working at those other locations is how that might affect your salary. You can see there's a yellow box at the bottom. That's normally where the total compensation model will go because we split out uh, base salary and total comp. But um, due to the, the model, we're, there, there isn't one there. In the other slides, it'll be the inverse. So we just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Mm -hmm. When we look at people of how they've prepared for their role, this has been static for many years. This is broadly true across the length of the time we've been running the salary survey. About half of us uh, have master's degrees, uh, a little bit under 30% have bachelor's, a little over 15% have PhDs, and then there's high school, uh, high school diplomas. And that has this effect here on uh, salary, all other things being equal. Moving over to education by field. Um, again, static from previous years, with one exception, a, a continuous slow growth of the number of people coming to us with specific education in user research or user experience or HCI ergonomics. Uh, in the past, you know, people would fall into this field with other things, but now there is more, um, more uh, people coming from fields that are specifically educating them to work in this discipline. When you look at uh, experience, I mean, uh, salary goes up with experience. If the inverse were true, I think we'd all be pretty scared. Um, but this is, I think, more or less what could be expected here. Uh, and, and a nice even split, likely due to random chance, but there you have it. When we look at role definition, again, uh, looking at position level, um relatively similar to previous years in terms of how people are split out but very useful to see as you move through the different stages of your career and, and gain responsibility what might you expect of the jump between those levels and how much you might want to ask for this is quite useful in order to uh think about that in our sample this year we had very few contractors as you mentioned less than 10. uh in general i'm happy to see more people being full-time employed. I think everybody should have benefits. I think that's nice. Um, I don't you know, necessarily have a good reason as to why, uh, but uh, it's good news nonetheless. When we go into gender and identity, I think this is super important. We always look at it uh, for two reasons. 
The first um, being that I think that we have a pretty good track record over the years of beating the average for the games industry in terms of representation. Doesn't mean that it's perfect, but I think that we are um, able to be quite proud of the amount of uh, representation of underrepresented groups in our discipline. So that's good news. And the second thing that's great to see is that when Andrew looks within the model to see if membership in any of these underrepresented groups has any impact uh, visible statistically in um, remuneration, there is no evidence for that, which is, is great to see. It's not to say that, you know, everything's peachy and solved, but it, at least when it comes to salary, um, it's, it's good news. And so we're, we're, you know, we check this every year, we'll continue to check it every year, but uh, it's good news. When we get into the various stuff, what types of game people are making, just quickly, so I'll go through uh, so you can see where you might expect to be working and what types of products, um, majoritarily console games, and then also uh, what business model, a lot of box product and games as a service, taking up more space. Um, and when we look at work location, what's interesting here is a good spread of how long people, uh, how many days rather people are spending in an office. Uh, and at the bottom chart, when looking at why they're going to the office, about half it's purely voluntarily. They go you know, when they want. 30% uh, they're mandated days, but they can pick the rest. And for um, all of the ones that are sort of individual little ones, what tended to be there was a lot of people saying like, well, I have to go to work when I have a study in a lab, which makes sense when you work in a lab. So that's good. Uh, when we looked at work-life balance, I was happy to see that um, the biggest bucket was people working right on the nose at 40. It's good for your, you know, it's a good number. Um, but those that work a few more hours a week, also there tends, there looks like there's some sort of relationship that you can make more money. Uh, make of that what you will, you know, mind your health. Don't overwork yourself. And then I love this one every year. Um, and again, that maybe this year, just due to random chance of, of the smaller sample, but this is the happiest year we've ever been. It's the highest level of satisfaction as a group that we've had in our jobs, which makes me very happy to know that, you know, coming out of the Pando times and sort of a rough stretch for some of us uh, living goblin style in our basements, um, the people in general are still pretty happy with their job in games user research. So that's always great. And then the last bit for me, before I hand it over to Andrew to talk about the model, is uh, we have one open question and there was no way I was going to sort through 160 responses. Uh, so I handed it over to our future overlords, the bosses uh, that will eventually take over everything. And I had Jet GPT crunch that down into five. Uh, and you can see those here. That breaks down really quickly into better career growth, better visibility on where your, your trajectory is taking you, uh, more training and professional development. Um, more work-life balance, specifically when it comes to stressful environments. Uh, more collaboration and communication, particularly intra-studio intra or intra-lab, um, which is great because if you're at this conference, it means that you are participating in that type of cross-organizational learning. Uh, it's nice to see. And then, uh, you know, obviously, uh, better inclusivity and diversity is something we can continuously strive for. Uh, even the robots know that it's important. And with that, I will give it to Andrew, who's going to explain the last changes to the model and how it affected the calculator for this year. Hi. Um, so I'll try to keep this um, a little bit brief. Uh, in past years, I've talked about how regression works. That's because the model is a multiple regression model. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over that this year. If you'd like to see those details, you can look at um, a previous year's recording. Can you go to the next slide? Johnny. So um, just as a, as a refresher, though, uh, how, how this was built is uh, we were trying to predict two things. It's actually two models. There's salary and there's total compensation. Um, and so that's the, the outcome variable. Uh, need to make some changes to it because it's reported in a lot of different currencies. So we convert them all to US dollars based on the conversion rate on de December 31st. Uh, then I do a log linear transformation because the data are skewed because it's income. Um, at that point, I take all of the predictors that we've kind of just been accumulating over the last few years, and I, I try to run a single model with each predictor and see what the R square is. The, the closer that R square is to one, the, the, the more variance that it's accounting for. Uh, 
So I order that from largest to smallest, and then I start um, successively adding in a new um, predictor. And then once I start uh, stop seeing gains to that model, then I, I stop adding predictors. So that's the process for, for building the model. It is by and large an empirical process, as you've seen. It's, I'm not like deciding which ones to put for second or third. I'm just looking at the outputs to make that decision. So let's look at what the models look like this year. So for base salary, um, I tried all of those predictors. You can see I tried 10 different models. I put those again in order um, based on how they performed individually. And it seemed like this year after model four, we started seeing um, just declines in in improvement. So just kind of cut it off at organization type, that significant F change, that, that's the p-value. And so once the p-value gets above 0.05, the, the model, the new model is not stat sig better than the previous one. Um, and for this one, the R square is at 0.7. Uh, next slide. Oop, go back. Oh, maybe something I happened. One early. For this one, you switch it early. Okay, the, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.82. I was like, 0. 0. who's been messing with my R squares? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So with total compensation, uh, you'll notice something a little bit weird. So we've got four, but on the fourth position, instead of organization type, it is education, and I actually had to play around with the position of three and four. Um, when I saw that uh, years of experience wasn't stat sig, I, I put education there. And then when I did that, they were both, uh, their p-values were both above 0.1. And so that wasn't great. So I switched it back and I saw, okay, years of experience is a term of art we like to use marginally significant, but it was acting as a suppressor variable for education. This essentially means like once it's in the model, education becomes stat sig. So I was confronted with the thought of, okay, um, I can do model number two or I can do model number four. And I just um, concluded that it was gonna be more useful for our community to go with model number four and have those two additional predictors. So that's what I went with. Um, and that adjusted our square is 0.7. Once I take out those uh, other predictors, um, from the calculation that didn't get included, that actually drops down to 0.68. So that's 68% um, of the variance accounted for. Next slide. So our base salary, the R square was 0 um, 0.82, so 82% of variance explained, and then total comp was uh, 86, down from 75. And again, you might remember this slide. This just kind of tells us or like your gut intuition, like what the significant or like what the meaning of that is for like the accuracy of the model. Like the 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 model is the line, but then the dot would be the actual value of what somebody's salary or total comp would be. Uh, next slide. So um, here's the only thing new here is the 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 ends. You can see this year I was looking at 127 down from. 220 uh, total compensation uh, also down quite a bit. The exclusion criteria for whether or not your survey was included in the model didn't change. Next slide. And then uh, the calculator. So um, this is available again. Go to the Grux Discord channel for the link. Um, we're not going to have a public instance up of the spreadsheet on the website. So just download that for yourself. As a reminder, it's possible to put in something silly into this thing. So you could be a junior with 30 years of experience. The calculator will give you a, a number, but um, that number isn't a good number. So just don't abuse it. And then um, you have to put in a, a value for each of the predictors from the drop down menu. Um, so just try to get it as close as you can. If, if uh, like, make it describe you as, as best you can. And then finally, uh, here is our statement. This is how you ought to, to interpret the output of this salary calculator. So this is, this is going to give you a predicted value that's produced by the calculator. It's empirically derived best guess at what the base salary or total compensation would be for a person who has the characteristics 
that are entered into the calculator's drop-down boxes. Okay, the model is based on self-reported data from the games user research community, um, and their salaries and total compensations are gonna be above and below that prediction. So that's it, thank you so much. Happy to be able to provide this again. And if you've got any more questions, you can ask in our um, Discord channel. Yep, that's all folks, thank you so much. So yeah, head over to the Discord if you wanna grab that calculator. If you have any questions, we'll try to be as responsible as possible. Uh, next year, we will do our best to get the word out a little bit more. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some help from y'all for that. And if you've used these in the past, uh, if you're in the 50% of people who've used it to help negotiate, you're very welcome. And if you're in the 160 who provided the data, then thank you very much. Have a lovely end of your conference. See you next year. Safe travels.